one lady I remember, and she's like, you're telling me that my cravings for chocolate cake is going to go away by the way you tell me how to eat? And I said, yeah, I pretty much can count on that. And I'm not kidding you. Six weeks later, she's like, I don't even want the chocolate cake. And she works in a bakery. Welcome to the Dr. Ashley Show. Sugar addiction is real. Research shows that sugar does the same thing to our brains as smoking, alcohol, cocaine, morphine. So really, how bad is sugar? It's pretty darn bad. And how bad is the predicament around our health because of our sugar consumption? It's really bad, too. The CDC projects double to triple fold increase in the number of Americans who will have type 2 diabetes in 2050. So the minimum amount that they are suggesting or predicting is about 21% of Americans will have type 2 diabetes by 2050. And on the higher range, it could be up to 33%. I think it's so wild. Type 2 diabetes makes me so upset because it's a condition, a disease that no one needs to have. In the 1920s, no one had type 2 diabetes. It was so rare. And now we've got hundreds of millions of people. 33% of Americans in 2050, and that's including our children, have type 2 diabetes when we really don't need to. Right now, the average American consumes 17 teaspoons of sugar a day. The American Heart Association recommends that we limit our sugar intake to 6 teaspoons for women and 9 teaspoons for men. And we're pretty screwed because in one can of a 12-ounce soda, there's 10 teaspoons of sugar. So just in that alone, and how many of us drink a can of soda, usually much more than just a can? There are 600,000 food items in America, and 80% of them are shown to have added sugar added in. In 2013, there was a study looking at lab rats, and they fed the lab rats Oreos, rice cakes, cocaine, and morphine. And they found that the rice cakes were just sitting there because those things are disgusting. And the lab rats actually went and consumed Oreos more often than they went to go get high on cocaine and morphine. They looked at a specific protein marker in the lab rats' brains. They found that there was a protein triggered in the reward pathway area of the brain at a significantly higher degree when the lab rats consumed the Oreos versus the cocaine and morphine. I think that's wild. I think it explains why some of us can't resist these unhealthy foods despite knowing how bad they are. And now we know that Oreos really are legal crack. So today, I want to talk about the signs of sugar addiction, food addiction in general, but we're going to be focusing on sugar just because we know the significant impact that it has on the reward center of the brain. So we're going to talk about signs of sugar addiction. I want you to be able to tell if you are addicted or if you know someone who is sugar addicted. And then I want to talk about how sugar addiction works in the brain, what's happening metabolically. And then I want to give you tips and tricks on how to overcome sugar addiction because I see it successfully broken every day with our clients at PhD Weight Loss. You know, I have been addicted to sugar. I've shared my story in previous episodes. But for those of you who are new, potentially new listening to this, I was a professional ballet dancer. And my mom stuck me in ballet when I was very young. I absolutely loved it, but I was terrible. My body physically didn't want to do the things that it was required to do. And I wasn't lean in the way that I needed to be for the sport. The demands, especially back then, were really extreme. And so I always restricted calories. I counted calories. And I thought that, well, I'll be okay if I just eat everything that's fat-free, low-fat diet. And I remember that I got addicted to candy. Corn. I was at boarding school for ballet where they handpicked like 30 students between the grades of ninth grade to 12th grade. And these kids were from all over the country, but only about 30 of them for all four of those grades. And there were beautiful dancers from South America and Paris and Russia and all the places that you think ballerinas come from. And here it was little old me. And I was too fat, according to them. I wasn't talented enough. So I was like, I've got to do at least 
least what I can control and I can control my food. And so I'm just going to cut back and eat these things that have no fat in it because I was under the belief that if you eat fat, you get fat. And I know a lot of you listening to this still have this belief because we've been inundated with this message. And so I started eating these foods. I would eat the instant fat-free pudding that solidifies just magically in front of your eyes. I mean, how does that work? That's pretty scary. <laughs> and then I would put fat-free Cool Whip on top of it. That would be a really great nutritious lunch that I would consume and then dance eight hours a day. And I wonder why I had stress fractures, but that's another point. And then there was a point where I would just eat candy corn. And I would eat so much candy corn and, you know, the little pumpkins too, that it would just burn my throat. And despite me knowing that it hurt and it probably wasn't a good thing, I was addicted to it and I would just consume more and more and more of it. You know, I have a client I wrote down, I remember talking to a client, Jane, and she was sugar addicted. And she would drive around to convenience stores, to gas stations, and she would park at the gas station and she would go in and she would get the Cliff Bars, the Quaker Chewy Bars, and the honey and oats, you know, they come in sticks and there's two sticks in a green bag. I forget what the Nature Valley, maybe something like that. And she would get multiple boxes of all of those and sit in the parking lot before she drove home and open and eat all of them. You guys, those are all sugar. That's why she was addicted to those specific foods. And Cliff Bars. Cliff Bars, no, if you're listening to this, put the Cliff Bar away and never buy one. Those are 100% sugar. And the only reason you might need a Cliff Bar if you're literally finding yourself hanging off a cliff and you need that sugar to pop you back up and save your life. But that is the only reason why anybody should ingest a Cliff Bar, especially if you're dealing with type 2 diabetes, sugar addiction. If you're not super active, uh, you do not need those things. I also had a client I was chatting with last week, actually actually in one of the offices and she was talking about how she'd done really well on PhD. She'd collapsed 60 pounds of fat. She broke her sugar addiction and then she got the flu. And you know, when you have the flu, sometimes you don't feel like eating veggies and meats and proteins. You just want that carby food, especially if that's been a habit of yours in the past, uh, kind of comfort food. And so she found herself going back to those foods and she was in for a session talking with a coach. And she's like, I just fell off the wagon and I need help getting back on. These are new habits for me. I haven't practiced these skills for a long time. And I was so proud of her to come back and get the support and really figure out how to instill these habits as her new identity. So I just want you to understand, and I share these stories with you to know that it is possible to break sugar addiction. A lot of us have been there. If you are struggling with it, there is hope. And it does take practice, it does take discipline, it does take commitment, but oh my gosh, the work is so worth the rewards. Sugar is just like illegal drugs. Large amounts are bad for you. I want you to take a deep look today at how you eat and what you eat. And I want you to figure out if you are sugar addicted, because we know awareness is the first step. And then I want you to start doing the necessary work and I'm gonna walk you through what that work is today together. So the first question you might be asking yourself is why? What's the point? Why do I need to reduce sugar or quit sugar, break the addiction that I have with the love of sugar? Well, the point is, is because it is linked to obesity and type 2 diabetes and heart disease. It negatively impacts your metabolism. It negatively impacts brain function. It's linked to cancer and premature wrinkles. So I bet many of you are like, oh, premature wrinkles. Now I know I need to break my sugar addiction. So let's start by talking about the signs of sugar addiction. It's like any addiction to drugs or alcohol, and you'll notice this similarities as we go through it. So number one, if you have intense cravings, they could be frequent and intense even when you're not hungry. Number two, if you feel a loss of control, if you've had repeated unsuccessful attempts to cut or quit sugar. Number three, if you consume sugar in large amounts and the pattern steadily increases. So this means that over time, you need to continue to increase the amount of sugar that you're consuming to achieve the same kind of dopamine high. Number four is if you have withdrawal symptoms, you're irritable, you've got mood swings, a headache when you attempt to cut sugar out. Number five is if you neglect responsibilities and you're just spending a lot of time trying to figure out where to get your next dose of sugar. Number six is if you continue to use it despite those negative consequences. If you're experiencing weight gain, type 2 diabetes, dental health issues, heartburn, esophageal burns like I was, I knew it wasn't doing my body any good, but I continued to consume it. 
if it's leading to social isolation or if you have a loss of interest in foods that don't have that sweetness or if you really have a challenge enjoying the natural flavors of foods because you're so used to consuming the high sugar, high palatable foods. If you're neglecting your nutritional needs and just focusing on these foods I just mentioned instead of the foods that find balance and wellness in your life. And if you feel like you have an emotional dependence to these high sugar foods, you use them to cope with stress or boredom or sadness. Those are all signs that you are sugar addicted. Hey guys, quick interruption to the show to remind you about GlucoCup Plus, my latest supplement designed specifically for weight loss and maintenance. You know, weight loss can stress your body, it affects your thyroid, muscle mass, and metabolism. Glucocut Plus is packed with patented ingredients to regulate your blood sugar for longer-lasting energy, enhance fat burning, and support lean muscle and your thyroid health. We all use top-quality ingredients, and it's super effective. It's like this all-in-one for metabolic support. Visit DrAshleyWellness.com, use code ASHLEY10 for 10% off your first purchase, or receive 20% off your first subscription order with free shipping. Plus, enjoy a 30-day money-back guarantee. Now, back to the show. So, how does it work? How do we become addicted to sugar? What happens is sugar causes the brain to release dopamine, and dopamine is this feel-good neurotransmitter, and it causes us to experience a little high. And the brain pathway, once it's used more and more by us consuming more and more sugar, the amount of dopamine produced with each sugar hit reduces. So this means that we need more and more sugar to experience that same level of high. The reward system is helpful in a survival as a species kind of deal. So it actually benefited us if we think of our ancestors you know it benefited us because it would continue our drive and desire to continue to eat so that we could store some excess fat and use it during times of scarcity and it kept us to continue to be on the lookout for more food it was this eat as much as you can while you can mentality and that worked way back then. But now with the abundance of food in these highly palatable food, it is really exploiting our survival function. It's a really big issue. I mean, think about if you ate as much as you could while you could right now in today's society. It would just never stop. And that's what's happened. Also, big food does not have our best interest at heart. They have a significant influence on our addiction to these specific foods. And I want to walk you through it so that you can see So that you can see under the veil and understand what's going on and be an advocate for your health. So number one is big food influences our addiction to sugar and and highly palatable foods through marketing. In 2022, there was $17 billion spent on marketing candy, beverages, foods, and restaurants. That's insane. Billions are spent to target you, your wallet, and occupying your stomach with their food product. They don't care about your health at all. All they want is continued revenue. They target your emotions. They link happiness with their product. I was actually at the grocery store. I was at Publix yesterday. And on the end of the aisle display were BOGOs, you know, buy one, get one. And it was for Honey Nut Cheerios. And by the way, when you go to the grocery store... Anything that's on the end of the aisles displays are foods that are targeting your wallet. Um, They have the highest profit margin on those foods, and usually those foods are the highly palatable, addictive foods where you're going to buy more than you really need because your brain is wired to do that and your body is wired to do that as well. And so there are the Honey Nut Cheerios on there, and um, they were a limited edition, which also makes us think like, oh my gosh, I've got to buy this now. It plays with our sense of urgency. High demand, low supply, limited edition. And the O's were in the shape of a heart, and it said, Dad makes my heart happy. And then on another box, it was grandma makes my heart happy or mom makes my heart happy. And this is pulling at your emotional heartstrings because what are you going to do? You're going to be like, oh my gosh, grandma does make my heart happy. I need to buy this box or, oh my gosh, dad does make my heart happy. I'm going to buy this box and give it to him as a gift. 
oh my gosh. And then there was the little heart stamp on there. I'm telling you, and I've shared this with you before, if any product has the heart healthy stamp on it, you need to just put it back on the shelf because it actually means the opposite. Marketing also targets us through persuasive language, through celebrity endorsement, commercials and labels and colors. They brainwash us. They put us into a trance. So your most suggestive time is actually late at night. And if you think about when do most of us watch TV, we're sitting down, we are exhausted, we have no more willpower, because if you've listened to my previous episodes, you know that willpower is a finite um, resource. And we run out of willpower at night, we are fatigued, we have decision fatigue, and we're just sitting there and we're kind of slowly drifting off. It is during that period where we're slowly drifting off that we are so suggestive. And if you think about the commercials that they're playing, they're either playing commercials about prescriptive drugs and making them sound like, oh my gosh, they're going to bring you total fulfillment and happiness in your life. And then when they talk about all the completely terrible side effects, they say them so quickly that your brain can't even accept or hear what has happened but it does see the beautiful images of you hand in hand with your lover or jumping up and down, enjoying your grandkids or your kids. And you think, oh my gosh, this is the drug for me. They also do it through commercials for food, Doritos, the Honey Nut Cheerios, McDonald's, Burger King. I'm telling you, they put you into a trance. Whatever you watch on TV at night, you only want to watch it if you want to experience it. Um, and that is, for me, why I no longer watch TV at night because, man, it really impacts me. And it's not just me. It's all of us out there. You have to be aware of what they're trying to get you to act on. So Big Food also influences us through food engineering. Uh, they discovered a formulation of ingredients, salt, fat, and sugar, the perfect amount that creates what they actually call the bliss point. The bliss point is where you just cannot say no because the foods are engineered with mathematical and scientific formulas so that the richness, the sweetness, the saltiness, the crispiness is so perfect, you can't just have one. What is that, Pringles? Uh, pop it and you just can't have one? It is so true because they have specifically designed it to be that way so that you have to consume more and spend more. The crunchiness, you can't say no. I think I've shared this story on a previous episode, but Doritos... They actually concoct their chips so that maybe one in 10 chip is saltier and a little bit more spicy. And you don't know it, but your brain is driven to keep eating those chips so you can find the next one that's more highly palatable than the one before. What does that do? That makes you addicted to the food and it also makes you consume more of it so you have to buy more bags of it. There's actually a lot of research on binge eating disorder and found that most folks binge eat exclusively on highly processed foods and the habitual intake of these processed food actually alters that reward pathway center of the brain and makes you more inclined to desire those foods. We really don't find a lot of people binging on steak or on a stick of butter or on heavy cream. There's just really only so much of that. And when you eat those natural whole foods, there's something in them that trigger the brain to be like, okay, man, I'm done. I really don't need to consume more. So if you think about having, and I know a lot of people love steak, so maybe it's not the best example, but if you think of having some chicken on one plate and container of ice cream on the other, what one are you more likely to eat and overeat on and why? You know, I have a client who started with me, Bobby, and he had 80 pounds to drop. He had type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high heart rate, and he was just dying and he was miserable. And he told me, you know, Dr. Ashley, I'm so nervous to start this because I don't know how I'm going to give up cheer wine. I've never heard of cheer wine before, Bobby. It's a Southern thing and me living in Asheville, I probably should hear about it, but I really am not in the pop arena. <laughs> so I didn't know much about it, you know, and he's like, I just drink liters of this every day. And I have since I was a kid and I don't know how I'm going to do it. Like he was very, very fearful, but we helped him through it. 
And I can say that it was painless for him, not that it was not a big deal, not that he had to commit and be disciplined and work through it, but it was not as bad as he thought. And I'm happy to say that Bobby has not gone back to Cheerwine in over two years and he has kept the 80 pounds off. He's no longer type two diabetic, no longer has high blood pressure and his heart rate dropped within normal range within three weeks of starting the program. So I share that story with you so that if you are sugar addicted or you know something someone who is, it really is a process filled with fear. It's a big deal, but it is possible to create that change. So the last way that they get us through um, big food influence is through portion sizes. So since the 1980s, portions have over doubled. And we like that because we think we're quote unquote getting better value. It leads to distortion of what is normal when it comes to portion sizes. So we get portion distortion. At PhD, you know, we provide a lot of the food to our clients at no additional cost. And the reason why I implemented that is to help with portion distortion. People would come in and think, oh my gosh, I need a lot of food or I need the specific amount. I'm going to be starving. And they wouldn't over time even know what a normal portion was because we've got such distortion. So when I'm able to provide the clients their breakfast meal or their lunch meal and they put it together and they're like, oh my gosh, this is it. And then they eat it and they're like amazed. Oh my gosh, is this seriously all that I really need to eat? I'm not saying it's a small portion, but compared as to what you get at Olive Garden or your super size me at McDonald's, it's smaller than that. But the thing is, the amazing thing is, is that our clients are not hungry and they realize and come to an awareness of what a normal portion is and they understand that they're still just perfectly full by eating just that amount. So then, how do you overcome? How do you break sugar addiction? Well, number one is you recognize your cravings and those bad habits as they occur and you recognize the sensations and you let these sensations flow in. What is it? What do you feel? Is it fear? Is it irritability? Is it sadness? It's okay to feel those feelings and you let them come in and then you let them move out whenever they're ready to move out, just like a cloud passing by in the sky. Label it. It's just a craving. It's not going to kill me. I'm not going to die. And I know that it's going to pass. Give yourself no option to give in. If you're going to an event or you're just coming home and that's your event, Give yourself no option to drink that cheer wine, right? It's just not something that serves you and it's no longer an option. Turn those foods to black and white and put all of the foods in your mind's eye that are healthy for you in the best, vibrant, most color. Those are the foods that serve you. The black and white foods, those processed, highly palatable, high sugar foods are black and white and they're nothing that is you know, going to serve your body. Visualize. A lot of people like to visualize the negative feelings associated with what giving in would feel like. What would it feel like after you've committed to yourself to break these ties with these addictive foods if you did give in? How would you feel if you gave in? What would that look like? How would your family members uh, respond to that if they knew that you'd committed to giving up those foods? Remind yourself of your why. Why do you want to overcome this? Why is this so important? You know, I find that for our clients, when we're establishing a why that's bigger than yourself is really important. So while you're doing this for yourself, you might also be doing it for your kids to be a role model for them so they don't have to go through this when they get older. It might be for your grandkids. I want you to think about what is your why and how do you make your why bigger than just yourself? Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Halt is a really good acronym for the times as to which you might succumb or more readily succumb to these addictions. If you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, if you're tired, you're going to be at high risk to give in to these foods. So what I encourage you to do is to create a plan for when you are hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, because all four of those are going to happen. But what is your plan? Is it you're going to have a cup of hot tea instead of the donut that you would otherwise consume? Are you going to go out and go for a walk and get some sunshine and change your scenery? I've said this before, but your environment is always stronger than any willpower. If you go home and you have all of these foods around you, it's going to be really, really hard. So you need to get your environment to support the easiest choice. Let me say that in another way. You want your environment 
to support your values, to support your goals. You also want your environment to support your easiest choice. And so what I mean by that is if you want during the times where you're hungry, angry, lonely, and tired to go grab some uh, deli meat, for example, and a piece of cheese and some avocado and not grab the gummy bears and the sweet uh, candy bar that's in the pantry, you do not want to have the gummy bears and the sweet candy bar in the house at all because you know you're going to go over to those foods. So create that environment so it's conducive to your overall goals. Go for a walk, go outside, change the scenery, change the environment. If you get upset and you get triggered, let's say, by your boss at work and you have a colleague who has candy on her or his desk and you generally go over there and grab one of those things, you need to change what your action is. So instead, it's, no, I'm not going to go over to Susie or Bill's desk and grab one of those Hershey Kisses. When I get triggered, I'm going to go down the stairs and just walk up and down the stairs. Or I'm going to go outside, I'm going to stand outside, I'm going to take 10 deep breaths. It's something to knock you out of that state, that state that you usually go back into that's a, an old habit. You have to change that state, change that habit. You would need to shift your metabolism. I want you to consider shifting how you eat. And this is what we do at PhD by designing their customized meal plan and helping them shift their metabolism into a state of fat burn. Their desire for these highly palatable foods actually goes away. I know it's really, really hard to believe. And you're like, oh yeah, she's just saying that. But really, if you were to go to our website, it's myphdweightloss.com and look at over 1,100 near five-star reviews, you will see so many of them talk about a mindset shift. There's one in particular, one lady I remember, and she's like, you're telling me that my cravings for chocolate cake is going to go away by the way you tell me how to eat? And I said, yeah, I pretty much can count on that. And I'm not kidding you. Six weeks later, she's like, I don't even want the chocolate cake. And she works in a bakery. So I just share this with you because it is possible. And if you can focus on protein first, whenever you eat, whenever you eat protein first and your healthy fats, some veggies in there, and maybe some berries, I promise you that if you design it accurately, then your cravings and your hunger for those addictive foods should go away completely or at least significantly reduce and you should have freedom from food. Eat in a specific order. And I just kind of briefly mentioned this, but you want to make sure that you eat your protein, your protein and your healthy fats first. So if there was a specific order, I would probably encourage veggies first, your proteins and healthy fats, and then if you really feel you need them, the starches and the carbs would be at the end. That's going to be helpful from a blood sugar regulation, and that there is also helpful for combating cravings. Don't purchase the crappy food. Don't get the honey nuts. Don't purchase anything that's at the end of the aisle in the grocery store. Maybe that's your first goal. I'm never going to purchase anything that's at the end of the aisle in a grocery store. Research shows that if you don't purchase that food, then it actually cuts your intake by a third. So at least that's something. If you're stuck in a house with kids or a spouse or a partner who just will not say no to those foods, ask if you can put them out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, the saying goes, but it really is true. So you could have them put it in a cupboard. They can have a special area and that's black and white. That cupboard is black and white to you and you just don't go in there. Stay hydrated and then sleep. Sleep is really key because I think I did an entire episode on this and the impact that sleep has on reducing cortisol. When cortisol is elevated, you've got high stress hormones, man, it's going to be really hard to say no to these high sugar foods. My husband, he's a physician during residency. He had to do a rotation where he did nights and that means he was up all night. This really pushes your circadian rhythm off high stress, doing stuff that he wasn't confident in, you know, really uncomfortable. And he'd come home and he'd sleep a few hours and have to repeat it. And it was just miserable. And he would go in the physician's lounge, which by the way, has the worst foods in it. There was no water. There was only like Coke and Mountain Dew and diet sodas. He would go in there and open up the the can and dump it out just to refill it with water under the sink because there was no water in there. It's just crap food in there for them. And he would say that he could generally, when he was working days, he could go in there and he'd have enough willpower to say no to the donuts. 
and he loves donuts. They're like one of his trigger foods. We all have those. And when he was doing nights and so stressed, cortisol levels high, not sleeping well, he couldn't physically, emotionally say no to the donut. Like he had a donut every night and put on some weight and felt so terrible, but he just couldn't say no. So, you know, I'm working through a course in miracles right now, which has been an amazing process for me, newer one. If anyone watching this is a student of a course in miracles, I'd love in the comments for you to share with me a little bit and help me out and share your experiences with it. But when I was writing the content for this episode, there was a lesson for me to do that day. And there's a lesson each day for those of you who aren't familiar with a course in miracles. There's 365 lessons and they're very short and you're supposed to practice them throughout the day. And so the practice for me this day was for me to repeat, I'm not the victim of the world I see. I'm supposed to close my eyes and repeat, I'm not the victim of the world I see. And then continue to repeat that throughout the day. And in the lesson, it specifically said, this idea is a particularly useful one to use as a response to any form of temptation that may arise. It is a declaration that you will not yield to it and put yourself in bondage. So when you see that food, that food that you are addicted to, you're going to say, I'm not the victim of the world I see. I'm not a victim to these Honey Nut Cheerios. I'm not a victim to this Snicker bar or this Cliff bar like my client Jane, right? You are not the victim of the world you see. So today I urge you to stay disciplined, to stay committed, to set standards for yourself. I want you to understand that saying no is a form of self-respect. Oftentimes we think when we say no, we're depriving ourselves or we're restricting ourselves. Saying no to whatever that food is, is respect. It's letting go of the foods you say you love that don't love you back. You deserve love. You deserve empowerment and strength. Today, I want you to think about getting better, not bitter, and dropping those foods that no longer serve you. I hope that you got great value from this episode and that you understand how sugar addiction works, but more importantly, that you can overcome. Please share this with anyone who you feel is struggling with sugar addiction because it is so common out there. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, please follow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and drop a comment below. Have you struggled with sugar addiction? If so, how did you break it? And if you haven't broken it yet, how can I help you and how can I serve you? Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, go check out the description. And in the description, you'll see a link to my new supplement company called the Dr. Ashley Wellness Line. And in there, I have the best electrolyte mix that everybody is loving. It has a lot of patented ingredients to help regulate your blood sugar and to help you break that sugar addiction as well, actually. You can flavor your water with it, and it is something that is supportive and conducive to optimal health. So please do go check that out if you're interested. Remember, you gotta step up to make the change, lead with your heart, train your mind, and do not negotiate with your body. I'll see you next time.